to the House. Mr Ian Blackford. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. In, in, indeed, Mr Speaker, and as always, and can I uh, say it's a pleasure to follow the Right Honourable Member for Chinkford and Woodford Green. We don't perhaps agree on the destination that we should be heading to, but he certainly makes his case with, uh, with passion. But I think, you know, in the points of order that have just been made there, it absolutely demonstrates in what is the absolutely fundamental piece of legislation which is going to affect all of us, our children, our grandchildren, for decades to come, we must have proper scrutiny. We must be able to tease out the facts of the matter. And it is the case that the government in London has an obligation to negotiate with parties from Northern Ireland, as the Right Honourable Member said, but also to negotiate with the devolved administrations in Edinburgh and in Cardiff. And in that spirit of generosity which you suggested from the government, then there has to be real dialogue and negotiation with all parties that are involved in this. Because the simple fact remains that whilst we on these benches have no desire to leave the European Union, I do regret that over the course of the last three years that we have not had the opportunity to explore in detail a compromise position which may have been staying in the single market and customs union, which in doing so would have resolved many of the difficulties that we now face when it comes to Northern Ireland. And I have to say, and I thank the right honourable gentleman for reminding us that we spent 100 hours in committee over Maastricht. 100 hours. More than 100 hours. Mr Speaker, what on earth are we doing? What on earth are we doing? Pushing this legislation through over a couple of days. And I do appeal to everybody, and I mean everybody. I'm looking at members on the government benches. Let this House do its job. Let this House do its job. And let's have proper scrutiny over something which is absolutely so fundamental. Being at the heart of the Maastricht Rebellion, I will simply make a very simple point. In the first place, there was no manifesto commitment to the Maastricht Treaty, and secondly, there was no referendum. I'm not, I, have, I have to say, I'm not sure what the relevance of that, uh, that intervention was at all. But, but let, me, let me say I, I, one more time, and then I'll. Isn't one of the most critical points that not only is this a new deal, but I can find no part of it which actually is meets a single promise that was made by the Leave campaign in the referendum. Not one of their promises has been met by anything in what is a very important new agreement. And it must be right that this place should scrutinise it. Because, as we've already heard, not only are people, I'm sure, inadvertently standing up and asserting things which don't appear to be the case, but as all of us look through this huge, weighty document, which contains new parts to it, we discover, almost on every turn of the page, something new that should be scrutinised. I have to say the the Right Honourable Member is absolutely correct. The bill was published last night. It takes time to have effective scrutiny of this. And when I look at the government benches, I can see many those sitting there. That if this was happening, if the boot was on the other foot, they would be screaming like mad that this House was not being able to express its de- democratic obligation to, to look at things carefully. But let me, let, me just, let me just look at one thing, one thing very quickly. We know that because... The transition period is going to end at the end of 2020. And we know that if the government wishes to seek an extension to transition, that it has to apply for it by the summer of next year. Does anybody, anybody in this House, really think that the United Kingdom is going to be able to conclude a complex trade arrangement with the, United, with the European Union by the summer of next year, so we can have the security of knowing that we don't need that extension. Quite frankly, Mr Speaker, they are living in a fantasy land if they do that. And it's on that basis, and it's on that basis that I say to members all around the House, but particularly opposition members, that I know are tempted to vote with the government this evening. 
Be careful. Be careful. Because what you're doing is you're writing a blank cheque to the Prime Minister and the boat leave campaign that runs this government to drive the United Kingdom out of the European Union on a no deal basis at the end of next year. And friends, friends, there is nothing you can do to stop it. I'll give way, I'll give way firstly here. Uh, I thank him for giving way. He made an excellent point there, but just going back to what he said about the ridiculous timescales, that even if this bill passes, all the stuff that's going to be done by the summer. Yesterday evening, I was in a delegated legislation committee for railway safety. It was a technical uh, paper, and even then, the government transition period was two years. So I made the point yesterday it's two years for railway safety transition, but this lot think they can get a free trade agreement and future arrangements done in a few months. It's a joke. Yes. 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 Well, my honourable friend is, is, is quite correct. It simply is not feasible. It is not feasible, Mr. Speaker, that the government can negotiate from scratch, because let's remind ourselves that none of this has yet started. It can't start yet. But it hasn't started that process of a trade agreement. And you look at the years that have taken place for Europe to conclude trade deals with other countries. Mr. Speaker, it is a fantasy. Yeah. And anybody, anybody that thinks that that's possible is quite simply deluded. Well, to the right hon. Gentleman for giving way. He's making a great stooshy about time in relation to this bill. But was it not the case that the SNP Scottish Government, when it introduced its continuity bill, to the Scottish Parliament operated a ruthless guillotine to prevent proper scrutiny of that legislation. That is, that, is, that is the case, Mr Speaker. They ran a guillotine on that bill. There was a very limited amount of time allowed for debate and scrutiny. And now he complains about that here. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. The continuity bill, was, which was dictated by the legislation which was going through this place yeah. and wasn't an international treaty. Ah, that is a completely <laughs> bogus comparison for anybody to make. And no wonder, no wonder, Mr Speaker, that people are laughing. Let me, let me make some progress and I will happily take interventions later on. No, I'm going to make some progress and I will. Mr Speaker, it, I will later on. It will come as... I haven't even started yet. It will come as... No surprise to this House that Scottish National Party MPs will not vote for this legislation that seeks to implement the destructive Brexit deal, and I commit all 35 of our MPs to do so. We will be united. Scotland, of course, voted to remain. 62% of those that voted in Scotland voted to remain. Yet again, we are the only part of the United Kingdom been taken out of the European Union, out of the single market, yeah. out of the customs union, against our will. Yeah. Yeah. England voted to leave, Wales voted to leave, and Northern Ireland is getting a differentiated deal. There may yeah. be issues with it, but oh, Northern yeah. Ireland is getting a differentiated deal. And that, Mr Speaker, at the very least, puts Scotland at a competitive disadvantage. Yeah, yeah. Yet Scotland, Scotland is being sidelined and silenced. Well, Mr Speaker, Scotland will not be silenced. The SNP are here to fight this toxic Tory government. Scotland's voice must be heard and we must be respected. Thank you, Mr Speaker. What about London? I really, I, really, I, really, I really have to question, are Conservatives thinking about these interventions before they make them? <laughs> Mr Speaker, Scotland is a country, London is a city, there is a world of difference, and of course, well, it, it reminds me of the statement that was made by the Prime Minister that a pound spent in Croydon is worth more than a pound spent in Strathclyde, so indeed, what about London? Mr Speaker, our Scottish Parliament must be respected and have its say 
on the legislative consent motion for this bill. Yep. And if I can say to the right honourable member, that's the difference. Yes. Because Cardiff and Edinburgh must provide consent to this yeah. bill. Yeah. That's yeah. not the situation for the City of London. Yeah. Members should note that the Scottish Government has now lodged in the Scottish Parliament a legislative consent memorandum for this bill. It concludes by recommending that the Scottish Parliament withholds legislative consent. Now, Mr. Speaker, we were told after our referendum in 2014 that we were to lead the UK. There was the respect agenda, that we were an equal partner, our opinions would be respected. Yet here we are today, our Parliament, our views disregarded, our rights as EU citizens to be taken from us against our will. I'll give way. Very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. I was going to take you back to what he said. It's absolutely right, Mr Speaker, that we do scrutinise and ask ourselves, is there time for a new deal to be done in the next year before the time runs out? But the same voices that are questioning that now questioned before this Prime Minister coming back with a deal this time. Secondly, the political declaration gives an indication of where we actually want to go. Work has been done. And thirdly, we're dealing with two aligned trading systems that work absolutely together today that need to diverge, rather than two divergent systems that need to come together. It can be done. It is possible. And can I ask him not to refer to somehow, in a year's time, it is the Conservative Party default position to seek no deal. I will not be searching for that. I will not be supporting that. I'm I'm grateful to the Honourable Member. I have respect for him. I have to say, though, that what has happened with the Prime Minister's deal is it's worse yeah. than the yeah. previous yeah. Prime Minister's one. But don't conflate, don't conflate what has happened over the course of the last few months with the challenges to doing a trade deal. Yep. And what I would say to the Honourable Member is that if the Government doesn't negotiate a trade deal in a timely manner next year, there is nothing he can do, there is nothing I can do, and there is nothing a single member of this House can do. It does not give you the right to seek an extension because that lasts with the Government, and if the Government has not asked for an extension by the summer, that is it. You are out on a no-deal basis. You are out of Europe. It is the end of the story. Mr Speaker, the House will be aware that the First Ministers of Scotland and Wales wrote a joint letter to the Prime Minister reminding him that the UK Government is required to seek legislative consent from both legislators for this Bill. And the Prime Minister must make it clear that consent will be sought from the devolved institutions and the will of the devolved institutions will be respected. That, after all, was the promise made by the Tory Government to the people of Scotland, that our devolution settlement would be protected and respected, Mm. not ignored. A promise, Mr Speaker, that has already been broken. In their shameful power grab at the time of the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, which gave UK ministers the powers to restrict the competencies of the Scottish Parliament. Well, I can see the minister shaking his head, but I'm afraid that's a matter of fact, unilaterally and without agreement. Mr Speaker, that was the first time in the 20-year history of devolution that any government legislated on devolved matters Uh, without Scotland's consent. The shameful act is a direct and deliberate downgrading of our devolution settlement. It disrespected those that voted in the devolution referendum of 1997 and the Scotland Act that defined the limitations of Westminster's powers and that this place could not interfere without consent, undermining the Seoul Convention, breaking once again the promises that the Conservatives made to the Scottish people. Mr Speaker, SNP members made their anger known at these actions, and I pleaded on that day, in fact, before you threw me out of this House, (laughs) and I don't quibble with your judgment, that Scotland will not stand for this, and Mr Speaker, we will not. Let members on all benches be warned. Support the Government today, and you will show disregard for the Scottish Parliament and the sovereign will of the Scottish people. There will be a price to be paid. 
It is worth noting well, that in their letter to the Prime Minister, the First Ministers of Scotland and Wales were clear that that extension must be sought. Oh, I have to thank you. Thank you to the Honourable Member. Would he also agree that this particular bill is extremely damaging to people in Wales? and that the, the rights that he is talking about in relation to Scotland should be absolutely afforded to Wales. This bill is totally damaging to the people of Wales, to the farmers that many of us represent and to those businesses. And I thank the Honourable Member for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, well, I'm most grateful, and she makes a, a very valuable point. And I want to thank the Welsh Government, who have worked hand in hand with the Scottish Government, because quite simply our rights have been diminished by what this Government yep. is doing. And we have a responsibility, not just across Government in the devolved areas, but across party to work together to make these points. Yeah, yeah. Because it is clear, Mr Speaker, that the devolved institutions must be given the full opportunity to scrutinise this legislation. And the fact remains, actually, that the Scottish Parliament is on recess. Mm -hmm. It is having to be recalled because of the desire of this place to ram the legislation through at short notice. So here we are today with this government pushing on ahead. And, you know, people watching can see the chuntering and the shouting and the complaining and the laughing, which we get every single time that we're in this place from Scottish Conservative members. The UK government is ploughing on against the requests of the leaders of the Scottish and Welsh parliaments. Mr Speaker, it is clear that this Prime Minister has no respect for devolution. Yep. Well, that, that, <coughs> that should come as no surprise to us, because the Conservatives have opposed devolution every step of the way. A leopard does not change its spot. At every step in the Brexit process, Tory governments have sought to frustrate parliamentary scrutiny, to frustrate our government, but they simply do not care. The Prime Minister does not care about process about Parliament or about the rule of law. Well, I'll give way up here, then I'll give way here. I'm, I'm extremely grateful. Uh, he's been very generous in giving way. Um, there have been some press reports that, that the SNP are abandoning the idea of having a, a, a second referendum, but in that joint let, letter, but in which he... In which, but in that letter which he quoted, the joint letter between the First Minister of Wales and the First Minister of Scotland, I'm pleased to say, uh, that they both called for that referendum and for an extension in order to allow it to happen. Can he confirm that that is still the case and that is still what the, uh, the SNP's position is? We have been, we've been full square behind the people's vote over the course of the last year, and indeed I spoke at the rally in London on Saturday, so I absolutely stand by the words of our First Minister in, in that letter. On that point, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. And a number of people today have raised concerns about the lack of scrutiny and the lack of time to look at this bill. And of course, the Honourable Gentleman has pointed out that Scotland has been ignored in this process, a nation that has voted significantly to remain in the EU. But does he share my concerns that in amongst all this, we continue to forget, conveniently for some perhaps, that the fact is that this referendum across the UK was won on a very, very narrow margin. Yeah. And the Electoral Commission has said that law, electoral law was broken and that has been swept yep. under the carpet. Yep. And I call into question the legitimacy of the result at all. Yeah. I, I think there are very legitimate questions to be answered. And uh, my honourable friend is quite correct. Mr Speaker, I'm conscious of time and I have taken a number of interventions. I'm not far from the end, but I wish to move on and conclude. conclude. Mr Speaker, it is really thank God for that. That's uh, that's what we get from the yeah. government side. That's the that's the disrespect which is shown to the Scottish people. And perhaps perhaps they should stand up and put it on the record. That, Mr Speaker, is an absolute disgrace. Mr Speaker, it is simply an insult to democracy that the government are trying to push this bill through on limited time. And I urge members I urge even those on the government benches to ask themselves, is this really how they want things to be done? Even the previous Director of Legislative Affairs at Number 10, Nicky mm -hmm. Costa, yep. stated in May that this bill would take more than four weeks. Yep. So, Mr Speaker, what's changed? Yep. Moreover, 
it was agreed that this legislation must not be passed until the UK Government have published an economic impact assessment of their deal. Yet on the BBC breakfast on Saturday, the Brexit Secretary Stephen Barclay confirmed that no economic analysis has been done by this Government on the final deal. Mr Speaker, that is the height of irresponsibility. No economic analysis on a deal that is going to have a fundamental impact on the lives of all our citizens. Each and every one of us in this House knows, because we have seen the evidence, we have listened to the expert, there is no such thing as a good Brexit. In every scenario, Brexit threatens jobs. It risks environmental standards. It risks workers' rights. It unravels the cooperation, the opportunities that importantly poses questions over the future values that the UK has fostered hand in hand with the European Union. Mr Speaker, this government is closing its eyes. It is putting its head in the sand and it's hoping that the sun comes out, the sunny uplands that the Brexiteers talk about. But that is reckless. It is foolish. The arrogance and the incompetence of the government cannot and must not allow to go unchecked. Our priority must be today to ensure that an extension is negotiated and secured with the European Union. So this House can scrutinise fully and properly the significant lasting changes this legislation will mean. In closing, I want to touch on some of the substantive points as to why, under no circumstances, will the SNP ever vote for Brexit and this shameful deal. Despite our efforts to compromise, this legislation will take us out of the European Union, out of the single market and out of the customs union. With the Prime Minister's deal, under a free trade agreement, Scotland's GDP would be around 6.1% or £9 billion worse off than if we stayed in the European Union. That, Mr Speaker, is equivalent to £1,600 per person. That is the cost of the Prime Minister's Brexit for Scotland. Northern Ireland businesses will have easier access to the European single market while simultaneously enjoying unfettered access to the UK market. There is significant uncertainty as to how the economic impact may play out, but this could see Scottish business losing market share with direct competitors, risk supply chains that may be reorganised to take advantage of Northern Ireland's preferential access to the single market, and may even play a role in location decisions in some cases. The SNP is significantly concerned that the removal of the commitments on environmental protection from the withdrawal agreement and restricting them to the non-binding political declaration opens the door to UK divergence from EU standards. The political declaration remains weak in relation to human rights, and in particular in importance of continuing UK compliance with the ECHR. Mr Speaker, Scotland will be worse off, unfairly disadvantaged, despite our will to remain. Therefore, I urge members, do not sell out Scotland. Listen to the will of the Scottish people. Protect our devolution settlement. Respect our democratically expressed wishes. Stand by the rights of the Scottish people. Businesses, farmers, crofters, fishermen, students, doctors and nurses. Stand by them and vote to stop this disastrous deal. And give the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish people their say. Thank you. Order. We will.